<laughs> I think one of the most interesting things that I've learned in my life as a born again Christian is that you never know what God can do with people. People are the quantum variable that's in the formula that given God intervening, you'd be amazed at how you can make the wrong assumptions or presumptions about people or about how things are going to be when God decides to use a person in a way that they never expected to be used before. And I am dumbfounded by it lots of times. I remember when I was uh, first saved, my first lesson on how God operates was pretty dramatic. I, I got saved and I came running home that night. You know, it was late at night, I think it was. And uh, I was coming home from Riverside and uh, it was dark and I came in the house and Went through the living room towards the kitchen. I saw the kitchen light on. My mother was sitting there. And I said, Mom, guess what? I got saved. You know, I said, you could be a born-again Catholic. You could be a born-again Protestant. You could be a born-again. And she said, go to your room. And so I turned around and went to my room, you know, because I was all full of joy and excited. And I went inside my bedroom and read my little pocket New Testament all night. <laughs> but she wasn't interested in what I had to say. And though I witnessed to my sisters, they weren't interested in what I had to say either. God saved them anyways. And the funny thing was, was that as he worked on them, you know, in different ways, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, like people like to say seeds got planted, whatever. But in my mind, I kept thinking, well, wow, you know, after, after my family got saved, I thought, boy, wouldn't it be neat if, you know, the rest of my family got saved? Because I was reading that scripture that talked about how... The household, you know, that this one man in Acts, you know, his household all got saved. Everyone in it, the slaves, the children, the parents, the everyone, you know, everyone, including the guards that were in this household, but they all got saved. And I thought, wouldn't that be neat if my family got saved? I didn't really pay much attention to it because I thought, well, there's no way that, you know, my stepdad would get saved. And one of them... <laughs> And, and there's no way that, you know, my other stepdad would get saved. And, you know, 10 years went by and later as life had gone on, you know, I heard about my stepdad that he had gone on, you know, and died of cancer. And I thought, well, that's a shame, you know, and I felt sorry for him. And then later on, I come to find out that not only had he died of cancer, but after he had divorced my mother, he had gone on back to his hometown, more or less, and he'd gotten married again and gone to Dallas Theological Seminary, and he'd become a pastor, and he died as a born-again Christian. And I thought, huh, wow, who would have thought? Then later on, I, I met my other stepdad, my sister's father, and I lived with him for a little while, and, you know, he had quit drinking, you know, and he was being taken care of by his family and you know, he was off on his own he was in a wheelchair and then I went into his room one day you know because he was living kind of a quasi lifestyle and I, I found the Bible and then I got a chance to talk to him one night and he told me that he'd been witness to you know and that he had, he had accepted Jesus but that you know he was off doing his own thing now because he didn't understand much of it but still the point that I'm bringing out is I never would have thought that I figured well shoot you know, if I didn't do it, they aren't saved. <laughs> As I've discovered in my life, God reaches out and touches other people's lives in ways you never know. You just let go and let him do it. He can accomplish so much more in the nation, in the world, in the end of the world, in your daily life, in your yearly life, in your monthly life, in your wife, in your children, in your hearts, in so many ways. But you never even dream that God can do. God can do it all. You just have to get out of the way sometimes and let him do what he does best, which is being God. The Lord reigns. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Will you not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree, that it cannot pass it, 
and though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot pass over it. Promotion comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is a judge. He puts down one and sets up another. You know, a lot of people have these ideas about political action committees, and if God is the one who sets up a man and sets him down, then I question the reality of where people get so wrapped up in these social occasions where they feel like they have to do so much sweat and effort in order to accomplish what God can do just by simply asking him to. If our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness in high places, wouldn't it be better that if we wanted a principality changed, we would simply pray? If we wanted a president or a government or some entity to be revised, that we would simply ask God to do it? it says he's the one who does it, and he reigns. Hmm. You think maybe we've gotten something backwards here? That we think we have to do it first and then ask God to bless it? Or rather, shouldn't we bless God for doing what he already said he would do in the first place? He changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. So God puts people in charge, not democracy. Interesting perspective. Maybe we ought to think about that the next time that we protest and that we contest what it is that God has done. And that if we decide that we don't like it, who are we deciding we don't like the decision from? God or man? You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, but be not troubled. If God be for us, who can be against us? Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? The very hairs of your head are all numbered. So fear ye not, therefore, you are more value than many sparrows. Take heed to your spirit. Master, we saw one casting out devils in your name, and we forbade him and told him, He's not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. Lord, wilt thou command Lord, wilt thou that we command down fire from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? Elijah did? But he rebuked him and said, You know not what manner of spirit you are. If God himself, Jesus, said, He that is not against us is for us, then Maybe we've got the wrong perspective about those people that are with us that we think are against us simply because they don't do it our way. Because if they're not against us, then are they not for us? If they're going about doing their thing? You see, those that are attacking the body of Christ are in reality doing things like we used to call in the body itself when it eats itself, autoimmune deficiency disorder, when it treats itself as its own enemy. It's made a mistake. The programming's wrong. It has to be revised and changed. You have to recognize that you're actually attacking the healthy part. So why are you doing that? If God said in the form of Jesus that he who is not against us is for us. Remember that. He who is not against us is for us. Think about it. Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua the son of Nun said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Envy you for my sake? Would God that all Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. The one thing I can't stand that I find a real frustration over is when the body of Christ attacks the body of Christ and then I come back in and I have to say something on the internet that makes me even more frustrated because it's aggravating to have to call to attention those that <coughs> exercise jealousy over someone else's ministry. I wish I could say that the great men of God are all spiritually walking in unity but the truth is, the greater the ministry, the more I find them bickering among themselves, acting as little children, that they want this to be a certain way. You know, I 
I hear things like uh, John MacArthur attacking a Billy Graham or chastising a Greg Laurie or doing all kinds of things that he's supposed to be some huge man of God and I think if that is such that he is, then why is he talking like such a child and acting like such a baby? I don't know. Maybe he's jealous. Maybe the sandbox isn't big enough for him to play in. The contradictions that I find often in the internet when I minister to the body of Christ is always about somebody fleshing out as opposed to somebody sharing Jesus. Because you see, when we share Jesus, Jesus keeps telling us to get along. You know, we got to stick it out with each other. You know, you got me, I got you, guess what, you know? I'm not going to shrink my nose for you and I'm not going to bob it or do anything, you know, get it artificially changed. And neither are you, maybe, <laughs> unless you're a woman. But the point being is God made us all unique. And so, uniquely, if we can come together, we'll be blessed. But distinctly, if we keep ourselves separated and we attack each other, God may cast us both far aside. Because we should not be attacking, but we should be, what? The fruit of the Spirit is love, loving. The fruit of the Spirit is joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And they that are Jesus's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another or envying one another. In my world today, as I had to write something on the internet, I'd have to say that in the circumstances that I described, it was great envy on the part of a man of God that I pray that he repents and that he recognizes that envy leads you to a misunderstanding of what God is doing. Because remember what the scripture said, if they're not against us, then they're for us. So why do we attack other men of God when they're not attacking us? That's something that I'm sad to say. There are some men and women of God that need to think about that. And they need to repent. <laughs> as I bounce the camera. It's a windy day today.